Fingerprinting is an essential skill for crime scene investigators, law enforcement, and forensic scientists. Because fingerprints are unique and no two people have the same prints, fingerprints can be used as a type of individual evidence for solving crimes, add security to devices such as a smartphone, or to verify official documents. This video will teach the lab skill fingerprinting by first, reviewing the three major types of fingerprints, second, demonstrating common methods for developing and documenting fingerprints, and third, explaining how to analyze fingerprints by fingerprint patterns. There are three major types of fingerprints. Each type is identified by its visibility and the material the print is made in. We will first look at patent prints. Patent prints are visible prints formed in a material such as ink, paint, or blood as shown in this example. To document patent prints, photograph them with a scale. Developing patent prints with ink is a very common technique that will be reviewed later in this video. The next type of prints are latent prints. Latent prints are invisible prints formed by depositing natural oils on a surface. They must be developed to become visible. Three common development techniques for latent prints are powders, chemicals, or fuming. The last type of print we will examine are plastic prints. Plastic prints are visible impressions made by pressing in a soft material such as wax or clay. To document plastic prints, photograph them with a scale. Plastic prints do not need to be developed and can be collected as they are. We will now review four common fingerprinting methods. Fingerprinting with ink is primarily used for creating patent prints from hand. To develop fingerprints with ink, you will need an ink pad, a 10 card to place prints on, and towelettes for cleaning. To develop fingerprints with ink, touch the pad of one finger to the ink pad, making sure to not roll your finger when doing so. Then lightly touch the inked finger onto the correct space on a 10 card. Repeat this process so that each of the 10 digits, eight fingers and two thumbs, are developed on the card. To clean up after fingerprinting with ink, we recommend using a fingerprinting towelette wipe to make cleanup easy. The developed 10 card is now ready to be photographed, digitally scanned, or used with a reference sheet to identify the fingerprint pattern for each digit. Fingerprinting with powders is used for developing latent prints on smooth surfaces such as glass. Applying powders can make latent prints not visible to the naked eye visible and cast prints in a material that can be lifted from a surface for detailed analysis. To develop fingerprints with powders, you will need magnetic powder, a magnetic powder applicator, fingerprint lifting tape, and a collection card. To develop latent prints with powders, first obtain a magnetic powder applicator and draw a plume of magnetic powder. Now obtain your specimen with suspected prints and carefully sweep the powder over the surface. If latent prints are present, they will begin to become visible as they pick up the powder. Once dusting fingerprints is complete, return the applicator to the source of the powder and disconnect the magnetic connector to release the powder back to its source for later use. The developed latent prints can now be photographed or lifted for analysis. To lift the print from the surface, first obtain a piece of fingerprint lifting tape longer on both sides than the length of the prints being lifted. Now place and secure the lifting tape on the developed prints. Gently pull the tape up from one side and place the tape down on a collection card. The print can now be documented and analyzed to identify fingerprint patterns. Developing latent fingerprints with chemicals is the preferred method for developing prints on porous surfaces such as paper. The supplies needed for chemical development include a chemical developer of either an anhydrin or DFO, note in this example we will be using anhydrin, a fume hood, gloves, and a steam iron may optionally be used to speed up results. To develop prints with chemicals, first place the prints in a well-ventilated area such as a fume hood. Obtain the chemical developer in a spray bottle, anhydrin in this case, and apply the solution two to three inches away from the surface. Allow the prints to air dry for two to three minutes. Left alone after treatment, anhydrin can take up to 10 days to develop latent prints. Alternatively, the prints can be developed faster by placing a cotton towel and steam iron on top of the treated sample for four minutes after drying. Most prints develop in four to 10 minutes using this method. When developed, latent prints treated with anhydrin react with amino acids in the print to produce a visible purple reaction. The fuming fingerprinting method evaporates cyanoacrylate or superglue to attach and develop prints. The primary use of this method is to develop latent prints on plastic or metal surfaces such as those of common household items. The materials needed to perform this include cyanoacrylate or superglue, a hot plate, 
a fuming tray, water, and a fuming chamber. In this example, a glass bowl is used for a fuming chamber for easy viewing. Optionally, powder and a brush may be used after developing prints by fuming to lift and analyze prints. To fume fingerprints, in a well-ventilated area, place a heating element with a fuming dish atop a heat source, a cup of water for added humidity, and the object being fumed. Add cyanoacrylate or superglue to the fuming dish. Turn on the heating element and enclose the items in a fuming chamber. Allow time for the cyanoacrylate to evaporate. Development of white prints on the fuming chamber indicates that fuming has likely completed. Once complete, remove the fuming chamber, turn off the heating element, and obtain the developed fingerprints, which should now be visible. These fingerprints can now be documented, photographed, and analyzed as they are. Optionally, fume prints can also be dusted and lifted to provide additional detail and analysis. Once developed, fingerprints can then be analyzed by identifying fingerprint patterns. The three primary types of fingerprint patterns are whorls, loops, and arches. The difference between each pattern can be seen by understanding and looking for fingerprint cores and deltas. A core is where ridges form a loop or the center of a loop, whereas a delta is a triangular ridge pattern with ridges that run in different directions. Let's look at each type of pattern in more detail beginning with whorls. A whorl has a circular ridge arrangement forming a pattern that spirals outward. Looking close, you can see that a whorl has one core and two deltas. The next type of pattern, loop, has one or more ridges entering from one side, curving, and then exiting from the same side. Close analysis of a loop reveals that loops have one core and one delta. An arch has ridges that enter from one side of the finger, rise slightly, and then exit on the opposite side. Unlike whorls and loops, arches have no core and no delta. Each of these three primary fingerprint patterns can be further analyzed by subtype. Whorls are made up of four subtype patterns. A whorl can be identified as being either a plain whorl or a central pocket whorl by drawing an imaginary line between the two deltas in a whorl. If a line between the deltas crosses the whorl, the whorl is a plain whorl. If a line between deltas does not cross through a whorl, the whorl is a central pocket whorl. A double loop whorl is not a true whorl. Instead, it is two loops that together appear to make a whorl pattern. An accidental whorl is made of two different fingerprint patterns combined. In this example, you can find an arch and loops have combined to make a whorl-like pattern. Loops can be classified as radial loops or ulnar loops. Radial loops are loops that open up towards the thumb or the radius arm bone. Ulnar loops open towards the little finger or towards the ulna arm bone. Arches can be distinguished as a plain arch or a tented arch. Plain arches have gentle ridges, whereas tented arches have steep ridges forming triangles near the middle of the print. While identifying primary patterns and subtypes can help focus in on potential suspects and fingerprint matches, in court of law, for any two prints to be considered consistent matches, they must be identified as a match by two different forensic examiners and be demonstrated to be a match in primary pattern, subtype, and having matching fingerprint minutia, which are the minute ridge patterns formed within ridges. This concludes our discussion of identifying fingerprint patterns. Now it is your turn to develop, collect, and analyze fingerprints.